All right, good morning. Uh, first, before we go any farther, I want to say thank you to the Surface Navy Association, all you do, to, this forum especially, to bring together industry, academia, the press, the media, the leadership, uh, and our SWOs, um, warfighters, to talk about today and to talk about the future and what they do. I, it, it's really a really incredible and important forum to us, and I appreciate all the time and effort that goes into it. So thanks for all the leadership that does that uh, and all the folks that make it happen. Thank you. I also want to say thanks, and I want you all to give a hand to Admirals Roden, Admirals Grady, Admirals Kilby, and Admirals Banta. You heard them speak in the last four days or interacted with them. You ought to be energized about the direction and thrust and positive morale of the surface force. And it has never been better, and I am incredibly pleased about it. So thanks to you, Tommy. <clears throat> <clears throat> All the three and four-star leadership got together right before the holiday, and Mick Pond was talking to us, and he, he's, he wrapped at the end, and he said, hey, I want to tell you a few things I'm not hearing from the fleet. I'm not hearing about money needs, I'm not hearing about manning needs, and I'm not hearing about deployment links. Boy, how wonderful is that? I've been in this Navy for 34 years. That is a nice theme to hear, uh, particularly over the last 15. Um, we're starting to turn the tide in that regard, and I think that's really important. And a lot of the credit goes to Tom and Chris and their predecessors and those before them, so thank you. Okay, lots to talk about. Um, Tom talked to you about uh, the platforms and the distributed lethality concept, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, certainly CNO came in, talked about his strategic vision for the organization, uh, what the strategic environment was. You heard the particular operational manifestation of that environment for Admiral Ferguson in Europe, in the Eastern Mediterranean, absolutely. Jim Kilby talking about tactical training, what we're doing for our young warfighters, all that very, very important. I'm gonna try to thread the needle here at the operational end, kind of roll up a little bit of what Admiral Swift is worried about because he didn't get a chance to come back here and talk to you all. Um, give you a sight picture on where we are based on what I told you all last year and some of the things that I told you were priorities to me um, and how important I think those things are as we think about the, um, the CNO's uh, maritime de design as we go forward um, and some other things that are on my mind that I think all of us should be thinking about, warfighters, industry, et cetera. Okay, last year, my priorities. I was newly reported to Fleet Forces Command when I arrived. <clears throat> I told you I had three things on my mind for the headquarters. Number one, was the see-through shortenies initiatives. That manifested itself in OFRP, implementation of the warfighting development centers, and continued pursuit at the operational level readiness of our numbered fleet commanders and their mocks, and all it takes to make that entity go. And I'm gonna spend some time kicking the podium about that today. Um, importantly, I said, I thought it was important to follow through on this because it set the conditions for our number two priority, which was to ready the fleet to be able to fight and win, operate in contested and denied environments of all kinds. And I think as the CNO has come forward with his first LOE or the blue LOE as we call it, you know, he's kind of reinforced that going forward. And then thirdly, and I told you, there's a little bit of inside Fleet Forces Command headquarters geeky speak, I had to make force generation processes work better with force development processes. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Okay, so OFRP. We've got three carrier strike groups just stepping off the line, getting started in these things now, starting with Ike here a few months ago. There's four things that OFRP has to do. It has to be able to rotate the force. It has to be able to surge the force for a big fight if needed. It has to maintain and modernize the force and get it to its end of service life. And it has to do all those things and reset in stride. Not only that, it has to match the resources that are put into it. And those resources are significant. They are the capacity in the fleet, the number of fleet units we have, and the types of capabilities that they possess. It is time, it is money. You cannot forget those factors going forward. <clears throat> it is a process and an amalgamation of subordinate processes to make sure a lot of commanders that aren't under my purview necessarily 
synchronize our efforts to produce the ends that we require. In short speak, one of the things we used to do was man, train, and equip at the last moment. After the training, slaved it to the deployment and got guys whole just in time for the deployment out the door they went. If you're going to ready a force to operate in contested and denied environments of all kinds, you have to back that up and get all those people out there earlier. Those systems have to be inculcated earlier, the maintenance has to be completed on time, and you have to get them out the door in that manner. This is the seventh iteration of how we generate forces since we instantiated FRP in 2004. This one has a name, okay? We've optimized this iteration to make clear that to rotate, surge, maintain and modernize, and reset and stride, you really had to make all these other elements come together uh, in that regard. So, but make no mistake about it, the fleet goes where the Joint Chiefs recommend and the Secretary of the Defense and the President of the United States decide. It is as simple as that. Anyway, we're stepping off the line here. It's going to take us a few years to instantiate OFRP. There is no doubt in my mind we are going to learn stuff along the way. We have already learned things. The subordinate processes in, in maintenance, in training, in people, in command and control. We've had to change some of our assumptions as we go forward. And I'm pretty pleased with the outcome overall, and it's going to do a good job producing the force for us. Okay, on my second priority, wanted to go after some of the advanced training immediately to be ready the force to operate in contested and denied environments of all kinds. We have made substantial adjustments in our advanced and integrated training in the last 18 months. We've done more in the last 18 months than we did in the last 18 years to adjust our integrated training. The work, Carrier Strike Group 4, Third Fleet, Carrier Strike Group 15, NWDC, all the WDCs as, as they have come online have done an extraordinary job stepping our, up our game on Com2X. We did 10 times the amount of operating in a contested and denied EMW, communications, navigation environment here just a few months ago, right before we sent Truman out the door, than we did just TR at the beginning of the year. And TR had made a substantial improvement over forces that went out the door in 12 and 13. That's really important. And that's just one example. I could go on forever about that, but I have other things to talk about. All right. Making force generation and force development work together. I kind of described the force generation process to you when I described OFRP. That's what we do down at the fleet level. A lot of the activity up here is budget formation and, of course, acquisition. That's what happens up in Washington. But there is a large pot of money that moves to the fleet and all the other syscoms that is responsible for generating the readiness of the force. Synchronizing all of that effort, not all of which works for me, um, is important to achieve our ends. At the same time, the good ac acquisition community and industry is bringing us capabilities we have to time in training to bring on board to make sure we're getting the full advantage of those capabilities when they're delivered to the fleet. We've got a better process now to improve that dialogue. <clears throat> I, I won't get into all the little, you know, meetings, uh, approval authorities, governance structures that make that happen, um, but it's been absolutely important to us. I, I, and I want to tell you kind of the juxtaposition on this. We sent the Theodore Roosevelt strike group out with NIFCA the Navy Integrator Fire Control Networks Counter Air, okay? That was more thankful that that all came together than it was thoughtful on the way. And we cannot have that going forward. Um, those guys did a phenomenal job, and they're about to give um, CNO and myself a, a, a deeper dive into just the NIFCA uh, experience they had on deployment and some of the training iterations. Um, but we've got to be able to bridge together a little better the near term and the far term um, to make these things work, and I have committed to CNO and empowered by CNO to make that Echelon 2 level um, better synchronized to go after ruthless execution when it comes to the execution of our budgets and the readiness of forces. Okay, that's the running fix, kind of at the end of the year, and I'll come back on this to take questions at the end of the session here a little bit. <clears throat> um, here we are, wake up, 1st of January, turns out there's a new sun in the solar system, right? His name is John Richardson. 
So, and uh, he talked to you all yesterday. So, you know, I have to kind of adjust these priorities. I owe him a conversation before I have it with all of you um, about how we're going to do that going forward. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about what he's had to say and, and what I think the relative alignment of those things are. Um, you know, the design for maintaining maritime superiority, you know, there'll be a little uh, adjustment in some of my eaches on my priorities, but it, we will remain aligned on these things is important. Um, and just to be clear, you know, if you roll up his first LOE, if he didn't get a chance to articulate it yesterday, he talked about maintaining a fleet that's trained and ready to operate throughout <coughs> the maritime domain from the ocean floor um, to outer space and in cyber and to be ready to fight and win in those environments. And then to ensure this condition by aligning our organizations, some of that I just talked about, to generate a culture of operational excellence to make that happen. He talked to you, I think, at length about the strategic environment yesterday. I, um, I mentioned that a little bit. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just kind of capture it just uh, for a second. Um, you hear this manifestation in joint parlance all the time. People talk about anti-access area denial. You know, the thing that I keep having to pull it down to for the fleet um, is, you know, maritime and fleet terms to make this right going forward. I don't want anybody to make a mistake about it. Our adversaries are offloading capabilities in order to generate capabilities to deny us our sea control. Now, we have the advantage right now. But as CNO talked to you about, um, that advantage may be eroding a little bit. They're trying to deny us our sea control to prevent our power projection and deny us our objectives, our strength around the world, that kind of thing. It is too callous and too casual to roll all this kind of stuff up as anti-access area denial. It doesn't relate itself directly to everything that we do and we're capable of doing and what we need to be focused on. He took you through Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, I'm certain uh, he, he, if he didn't, should have talked a little bit about Daesh and the current fight that's going on out there. But this operational approach is kind of universal, right? They're trying to bring about some ambiguity in phase zero, use some high technology to reinforce that deterrence principle that they're using, okay? Little green men, cabbage fleets in the Western Pacific, and CNO is going after that when he says we've got to be able to train the force to operate in environments that are below that level of warfare. And he's talking about that level specifically. These methods, the little green men and the cabbage and the, the marrying with the, the precision guided munitions is important. They're trying to create areas or bubbles in which they can hold us out. <clears throat> and for Russia and China, as they step up to a more conventional conflict, escalate to de-escalate, they're able to challenge us a little bit. We need to maintain our edge. That's the point of what he's talking about. But make no mistake about it. They are responding to our advantage. Responding to our advantage. Um, they have their own strengths and they have their own vulnerabilities in their networks, in their sensors, in their con ops, in their tactical execution, in the quality of their people. You know, all important factors. I could list another dozen. And that's going to be part of the fabric of what we're doing as we go forward. <clears throat> and as I said, the operational approach of these potential adversaries is pretty similar, but the tactical manifestation is different. You think about the ground and the geography in the eastern Mediterranean, you think about it in the Gulf, you think about it in the Strait of Hormuz, you think about it in the Western Pacific. It's all a little different. And the approach of each of those adversaries is a little different in those areas, right? So China, much more depth. Width, ocean floor, outer space, deep into the country. You know, Iran's arrayed very much coastal, coastal defense, small boats, swarms, all that stuff. That's what I mean. We're still trying to challenge our sea control in there and prevent our, prevent our fires. Our obligation, Tom is going after this with distributed lethality, but our obligation here at Fleet Forces Command to help synchronize this global Navy to go after this. Okay, a Navy of this size and if there is a big fight anywhere on the planet, those assets are going to be coming from all over. So the fight in the Western Pacific includes assets and forces that are here on the East Coast of the United States. The same is true in the Middle East, things like that. Two thirds to three quarters of this Navy, depending on how you dice it by platform, by airplane, whatever, is gonna be here 10 years from now. We're gonna be fighting 
with two-thirds to three-quarters of the Navy we have today, okay? This is why the instantiation of warfighting development centers stepping up, you know, back into this important portfolio of contested and denied environments is so important to us. All right. I have the advantage of <laughs> kicking around out there for a really long time. Uh, and if you don't remember, about 10 years ago, they produced a Navy operating concept that talked about aggregating and disaggregating the force. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, this term distributed is incredibly important to us. And as I read in industry, as I read in the blogs, academia, elsewhere, um, the etymology of these words are really important to me. Um, and we have to start saying the same thing or we have to start citing why, you know, our positions are a little different on this thing. Webster's always comes in handy. My team down in Norfolk knows this pretty well. Aggregate, formed by the collection of uh, units or particles into a body, a mass, or an amount. It is a collective, right? Aggregate. Disaggregate, separated into component parts. And if you think about our operations in Fifth Fleet especially, over the last 15 years, it has been a disaggregated approach. You look at the tasks, missions, you know, for many of you uh, to relate to, but tasks, counter piracy, ballistic missile defense, strikes ashore in Afghanistan and in Iraq and Syria, you know, those kind of manifestations allowed you to disaggregate the force. Each one of those disaggregated forces had their own small tactical networks to command and control that stovepipe of activity that was going on down there. I'll give you that, it's just example. Dispersed, to cause to break up, to cause to become spread widely, to cause to evaporate or vanish, to spread or distribute from a fixed or constant source is the fourth thing. So distribute, characterized by a st statistical distribution of a particular kind, or related to or being of a computer network. This is the advantage we have in distributed lethality. I know Tom took some questions about, well, what is this about? Is this just about a stick? Is this just about a sensor? Well, it's more than that, you know. It's about our ability to deliver the situational awareness that's required to distribute the force statistically so that it is able to project the fires that are necessary to achieve the fleet commander's objectives and provide the defense of its own units and the other units that they're required to assist. Okay, there's a limb fact in one of the domains in all that, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Electromagnetic maneuver warfare, counter ISR, NIFCA, all this, certainly our partnership between the submarine force and the surface forces when it comes to distributed lethality, and that is a partnership, um, speaks to our ability to distribute our sea control fires, and distributed lethality speaks to our overall fleet design and evolution. It is not a platform need. It is a fleet need. And this is why we've been focused hard on the operational level, what the numbered fleets are capable to plan to, what the systems are that they have, their ability to take advantage of strategic systems, push them to the tactical unit, have those tactical units exploit those systems, and achieve the long-range fires that Admiral Roden is talking about. This is incredibly important to us. A fleet that leverages and benefits from distributed sensors and this kind of battle space coverage, but aggregates in battle space awareness, aggregates in the command and control of command and control, and has the ability to mass its kinetic and non-kinetic fires can operate in a distributed manner. That's a lot of work. That's a lot more work than a stick and a sensor, okay? I'm not a Pollyanna about this. There are some vulnerabilities in a structure like this, but we cannot devolve force to everything is going to go back to mano a mano, five inch gun on five inch gun or less, um, if your adversary is able to protect their networks because he will outstick you. So you have to have that. There's some security that's required. Okay. I keep coming back to three focus areas. Some of these are advantages, some of these are concerns, some of these are things to build on. When we think about the fleet, and I said to you, two-thirds to three-quarters of the fleet is what we're going to take going forward. First, the undersea domain. We have the advantage in there, a significant advantage right now. 
It is not a permanent advantage. Again, I'm not a Pollyanna about this. But it is a limiting factor in our distribution. <laughs> Multifunction towed arrays on our surface ships, widely distributed to all platforms, is really, really critical to us. As I said, we have some advantages here. You should see these P8s. They are an extraordinary capability. I have a generation of aviators that have been taught to fly maritime patrol aircraft over the dirt and use ASW as a second priority, and we are trying to flop that and working hard with the joint ISR gods to bring those assets back as much as we can. I track by the unit what our ASW readiness is in our P8 force. Our SSNs are doing phenomenal work um, across the globe, across the globe. Um, if you are an old Cold Warrior uh, submariner, you should be extraordinarily proud of the professionalism and the operations that these folks are doing. Where do we need to go? Offboard vehicles, netted offboard vehicles. This will contribute to this theater understanding, this operational level, this numbered fleet understanding of the total undersea picture and that threat picture. Um, and it, it's not going to be fundamentally leapt in revolutionary technology until we get the offboard vehicles there and uh, net the netted sensors that would come with that. That's a huge opportunity for the surface force, by the way, and I'll come back to that. Okay, our next advantage and focus area, our networks. The integrated fire control network is phenomenal. Every time somebody brings a new platform, whether it is strike group inherent, carrier strike group inherent on the wing or in a cruiser destroyer escort, as if they're starting to bring sensors forward from space, P8, submarines, all that stuff, how do we get it into the fire control network? Because if it's not contributing there, we are shortening our sticks in every sense, in the air, below the sea, on the sea. Um, there's a lot to be done there. EO, IR, all these other sensors that we can bring in space, on the surface, again, offboard vehicles are gonna make a difference um, to these networks going forward. Um, we've gotta be able to distribute that tactical SA. We've gotta be able to defend the networks to distribute that. And we have to be able to pre preserve them in a fight. It's incredibly important to us. All right. <clears throat> lastly, or excuse me, not lastly, third, our modularity. You've seen this in our history, you know, the VLS. You know, thank God for those folks that thought of VLS um, back in the 1970s. You know, we see it on the wing, too, of our strike aircraft, right? And we see it in our air wing, that kind of modularity. We're also seeing it now in mission bays. This is going to be an incredibly important capability for us going forward. Um, there's work to be done here, and I'm truncating my talk here a little bit to get SECNAV in, in here on time. Um, we cannot go backwards with an asset that does not have a mission bay now. We will not get to the kind of offboard networks that we are required to have to change our sensing systems unless we have that LCO, okay? The frigate instantiation is fine with me as well. Um, we can't go backward to some other whole form to do that. I said last year, when we talk about distributed lethality, we have to distribute the fires, and we gotta distribute the sensors, and we have to distribute the costs. Okay, not everything can be a golden BB on the way here, and we've gotta be able to take advantage of that. The thing that we need to work on, space, weight, cooling, and power. Some of this is about margin, we have to build into these assets. Some of this is about what the offboard vehicle or the strap-on box or whatever the case might be, you know, what it has to draw on as well. Okay, we can't quite get there unless we're taking the basic physics into account. All right, lastly, our sailors. All the tech in the world is not gonna win a single flight on its own. It takes people. And more than anything, that is our asymmetric advantage. I was talking to somebody last night who was lamenting something he was watching on TV over and over again about America's youth, and he said, I spent a few hours on a destroyer and I slept well that night. Trust me, I sleep well at night uh, thinking of that as well. Our undersea, our networks, our modularity advantages can't be realized without the imagination, innovation, and leadership of our sailors. They provide the ultimate asymmetric advantage. And it's the effort of our sailors evaluating concepts, refining doctrine, and practicing during exercises. This is the process that harnesses the creativity, ingenuity of youth, 
and provides a tactical edge to our fleet. This is why we have the WITI program. This is a paradigm shift for the Surface Warfare Force, okay? You know, it, our focus has been all about command for about three decades now. To value lieutenants and lieutenant commanders with supreme <laughs> tactical extra expertise in a portfolio, have the courage to listen to their critiques, take it on board at the leadership level, and be better the next day is a change in surface warfare culture, and you all know it. Um, and we need to work on this hard from 010, you know, certainly down to 05, 04, 03, the whole way. We've come a long way this year tapping into the creativity and innovation of these sailors. And if one assumes constant resources, time, funding, manpower, you need to look at different ways to cultivate tactical excellence. Improving our COM2X complexity, establishing the WDCs, refreshing the doctrine, the lessons learned repositories, putting them in formats and delivery mechanisms that make them usable and useful and attractive to our young people. These are all needed improvements. But to truly change the pace of the learning, the fleet needs to increase tactical training surface area. Just like any chemical reaction, you have the reactive elements, then the reaction area. That's what we need to kind of expand on. And some of this is going to be about the delivery of this stuff going forward. Moving ahead, we have to find a way to increase that exposure beyond the traditional military practice of large force and command post or headquarter exercises and war games in single digits each year. We need to drive them down to the wardroom, the chief's mess, the tactical element level um, in our units. But leveraging our biggest advantage, our sailors, and harnessing their ingenuity while they hone their technical and their tactical proficiently on a significantly increased basis, this is expanding our training surface area and will provide enduring su superiority. All right. I gave much of my closing at the beginning, my gratefulness for Tom Roden and his team and what they've done going forward. Talked a little bit about where we are on things that we instantiated here last year, things that are being continued focus as we go forward next year, and then some of the concerns, advantages that we need to be able to leverage if we truly are thinking about a distributed fleet, not force, as we go forward, because the power is going to be in that distributed fleet.